Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Heidi Meyer, and I am the Interim Dean of the Monte Ahuja College of Business here at Cleveland State University. I'm very happy to welcome you to our November 2022 Cornerstone Speaker Series today. Today, our topic is digital marketing, and serving as our moderator is Dr. Sabrina Liu. Dr. Liu is an assistant professor in our marketing department here at Cleveland State and studies digital marketing, including social media, big data, and crowdfunding. We are very much appreciative that Dr. Liu has agreed to serve as our moderator today, and I will now turn it over to her to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Thank you, Heidi. This is Sabrina. It is my pleasure to introduce our three panelists today. First, we have Brad Dietmar. Brad is the Senior Vice Pres President of Performance Marketing at the VMLYNR. In his role, he works with clients of all sizes and budgets on a number of digital marketing initiatives. He is also an executive MBA alumna of CSU. Next, we have Crystal, Christy Pashkowski. Christy is the director of marketing for Direct Recruiters INC. In her role, she manages all marketing functions for direct recruiters, especially digital marketing efforts. Last, we have Ashley Topo. Ashley is the di director of marketing for Philadelphia Cream Cheese, which is a part of the larger Kraft Heinz company. She is also an MBA alumna of Cleveland State University. All right, let's jump right in and discuss some broad issues today. First, what do you do um, in terms of digital marketing? Let's start with Brad first. Hey, uh, thanks for, for having us on here. Uh, yeah, I think it's a broad question. So we're a full service agency. We work with a lot of clients that have a lot of different needs, but kind of in broad strokes, we do paid media with search, social, influencer marketing, programmatic, which would be like display, streaming video, streaming audio. Um, we do organic search and organic social uh, strategy and content calendars and, and support. Um, web dev and uh, performance content and conversion optimization. A lot of analytics is a lot of where I live. I'm, I'm the data geek. Uh, and then uh, from a creative side, we handle strategy and production and uh, execution as well. So we kind of try to help fill everything across the board when it comes to digital marketing as much as possible. Thank you, Brad. It sounds like a very broad spectrum. Let's move to Christy to listen to her, what she does. Yeah, um, just to echo what Brad said, thanks so much for having me. Um, I am the director of marketing at uh, an executive search firm called Direct Recruiters. And um, in the recruiting firm, we're relatively large with 85 people, but you know, as a smaller business, just in general, um, we just have a two-person marketing team. And um, really what we focus on in terms of digital marketing is um, web development, uh, web maintenance, SEO. Um, we work a lot in Google AdWords and then just social media with a lot of our focus in, in LinkedIn. So really our goal is to just gain brand recognition um, and then most importantly, drive traffic into our, our website that can be converted into paying clients. So um, with a little bit of ad campaigns, ad content, um, high authority web content, um, our, you know we really want to drive in measurable ROI. Thanks, Christy. It sounds like you guys have different backgrounds. And last, let's see what Ashley does. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Topol, um, coming to you live from Chicago. Really excited to be here today. Currently, I am the Director of Marketing for Philadelphia Cream Cheese. So hopefully all of you are going to be buying your, cheese, your brick cream cheese this holiday season to make your cheesecakes, because it is core cheesecake season. But specific to my responsibilities, so I'm responsible for the entire marketing mix for Philadelphia, but specific to digital and consumer communications, my scope includes content creation, media planning, brand and social media strategy, execution, shopper, retailer marketing, and store and digital, and online programming and e-commerce. My core focus is all about finding ways to make Philadelphia cream cheese relevant in culture 
and forge authentic relationships with our consumers so that I am driving brand desire for my product at the end of the day because I want them to purchase it. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks for giving us an overview. I'm really impressed that you have diverse backgrounds. And uh, I also would like to know from your experience, what do you believe is the right mix of the tools for digital marketing? And this time, let's start with Ashley first. Great. Yeah, I think in order for me to answer that question, the first thing that we, we need to do is define what I call on the brand marketing side, strategy side, uh, a well-defined business job to be done. So what does that mean? That means that we want to make sure that we have one goal to align the entire marketing mix, not just digital, but everything we do. And it merges the business need with the consumer behavior change that we want to happen. So for example, on Philadelphia, our job to be done is to drive brand preference with our core millennial consumer by showcasing our unmatched and immersive quality of Philadelphia cream cheese. In that statement, you hear that I wanna drive lower funnel preference, who I'm gonna do it with, and how I'm going to do it given what my brand offers. Um, the next thing we wanna understand and answer is who is your consumer? So we call this process de-averaging the consumer, but really what that means is understanding the behavioral uh, demographic, where they are in media, what they're doing, so that you can understand A, how big they are in terms of how you target them and how you talk to them. And two, most importantly, how you connect their need states or their needs with our product in the best way fit. Once you answer those two things, then we can talk about the tools that we need to use. So an example on Philadelphia, our target consumers, the millennial experience seeker, we call them. Um, they love to cook. They're influenced by their friends and family, not by external sources. Um, they are all about um, digital. They were born and raised in the digital environment and they're social sharers. So in social, in the space of social, they are commenting, liking, reviewing. So they are very vocal. So once we understand that, it becomes really easy for us to set media objectives and identify the right tools. For us specifically, uh, we are really big heavy users of OLV and OTT, given where our consumer is, paid social, um, when I say paid social, I mean like a constant pulse of evergreen assets, we call them, that are always on to drive awareness um, and lower funnel tactics as well. And then um, search as well as custom digital partnerships in the native space. Thank you, Ashley. I can't agree with you even more. Uh, I also tell my student that identify the goal and the customers are important before any steps jumping into the uh, digital marketing tactics. Uh, okay, next let's hear Christy's opinion. Um, so coming from a, a service company, it's, it's you know, obviously going to be a little bit different from uh, my experience, but um, I think first off, obviously every company is going to be a little bit different with what mix of tools is right for them. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, you know, it's not only important for our company as a whole to, to come through with a strong brand, but we also need to help our recruiters um, and salespeople essentially to, um, you know, be able to market themselves because they're they're the ones selling the services. So, you know, on the company side with a kind of a small budget uh, was what we're working with. Most of our paid marketing is in the form of Google ads. And that's kind of what we've we've found is, is helpful for us. And we can, um, like I said, we can find measurable ROI from that. So, um, and then in addition, you know, we really want to make sure that our SEO and um, optimizing our web pages goes hand in hand with that. So we just really focus in on making sure that the content that we have on our pages is relevant and um, draws in the the people that we want to fill out a form and drive them into our our system, basically. So, um, that's that's one thing and that's that's kind of like what we really focus on is is maybe what you might consider more free like SEO where you can kind of um you know maintain your website and things like that and then like i said we really uh work with our recruiters and salespeople to be able to build out their brand on social media channels and find out how we can optimize their profiles um and that's just again something that we kind of can do on a a lower budget where you can use free platforms to um, sell your services. 
Thanks, Christy. Um, you offered a lot of good suggestions for um, the business with limited budget and a smaller budget. That's really good information. And uh, what's your view, Brad? Yeah, so I, again, because I work with a lot of different clients, can confirm it is going to gonna vary uh, quite a bit depending on what your goals are. I love uh, what Ashley was saying in terms of a rough strategic framework. We call that get to buy, get a particular segment to behavior change by here's your strategy or your tactic, right? Um, you know, and so I work with, uh, uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies across uh, a number of different verticals from, you know, durables and equipment to finance to CPG to um, uh, even pharmaceuticals. And most of my clients, uh, because I lead the performance marketing side, what they're mostly looking for is some sort of directly attributable conversion cost for acquisition, ROI, ROAS, uh, return on investment, return on ad spend sort of metrics. Um, so it's going to be probably a little different for me than others, but the first place that I usually start is making sure that you have the right uh, measurement frameworks and systems in place, making sure that you understand um, how you're going to track that behavior change or that action that you're trying to drive and making sure then that the environment where that conversion or that behavior is happening is optimized first. Because if you think about it just in terms of like landing pages or websites or et cetera, you know, I could spend a few thousand dollars uh, improving my conversion rate. I might double my conversion rate. And then the next, you know, million dollars that I spend on ad is going to have a uh, 2x efficiency based off of that. So, you know, that's really where we start out. And then we build out the plan based off of the specific, uh, you know, conversion point that we're trying to drive and what the historical performance is and other clients as well. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Um, it's really great information. And uh, I think for our audience, it's important for them to know, okay, how do I exactly do it? How do you conduct the digital marketing? So um, I have some questions from the implementation perspective, and I'd like to know your suggestions for small, medium, and the large companies. As you noted, it depends on the company's size, the goals. Uh, specifically, I have three questions for Brad and Christy. And after the questions, Ashley will show us an excellent example using Philadelphia cream cheese as a case to showcase how we actually do it, how we implement it. So let's start with Christy for this set of questions and followed by Brad. Our first question is, what is the uh, overall framework you are using for implementation purpose? So for any um, digital marketing initiative that we have, I think it's most important that we kind of just start with the end goal. Um, mm -hmm. What are we looking to get from this, you know, marketing effort? So, you know, whether it's that we want to gain new clients or we want somebody to sign up for a newsletter. Um, in some situations for other businesses, it might be they want them to buy a product. Um, but uh, whatever the goal is, I think that's where we start. And um, and that way, that's what you can measure. So um, from there, you know, you can start by kind of targeting out who you are, are looking for from there. And then um, I can speak from DRI's perspective, I guess, with with our example, we are looking for hiring managers. And, you know, it's not the easiest sell all the time because people don't love to use recruiters all the time. Um, so but we've found uh, over the years that if they are looking for a recruiter, it's often they're going to type it into Google and search for a specific industry. Um plus recruiter. So what we've we've really tried to do is to, like I said before, optimize our pages. We work in a lot of different verticals. So I really focus in on doing keyword research um, and trying to rank uh, as high as possible organically first. And, um, and then again, we build out ad campaigns to try to go hand in hand with that. And then from there, um, that's that's sort of what we're able to measure to get that conversion. And for us, the conversion is to show up for a, a search query and then we want them to either click an ad or click our, onto our webpage and then fill out a form. Um, and then I can track that client all the way to hopefully a placement and that's, you know, money to the business. So um, I, I think that's, it's not very granular um, way to explain it, but 
it's that's that's really where we focus in our efforts. And um, like I said before, we we do a lot of social media for for you know brand recognition, and we might not see as much business actually coming through that, but it's it's helpful for that um, name share and just even if you're trying to attract new employees, it's it's worth it to put effort into that as well. All right, thank you. Brad? Um, call an agency? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so it's actually very similar. Um, as I said, I, I tend to start more from the measurement side, which is you know also kind of where Christy's at because she's held to very uh, specific goals and, and targets. So identifying the objective, which is also what, what Ashley was talking about, that's usually going to be some sort of lagging. We talk a lot about lagging and leading metrics. Um, so your business objective is usually going to be something that you can't measure until after it's happened. And then you look back and say, did we do this? Yes or no, right? Uh, then what you're going to want to do is identify leading KPIs or key performance indicators or metrics uh, that are uh, preconditions for that. So a great example is like if I want someone to uh, click, then I need to show them my message first. I have to give them the opportunity to engage. If I want them to engage with my content, they have to click to my site. If I want them to convert, they have to engage with the content on my site, right? So what you're trying to do is get down to the KPI that is the closest thing to that objective that you can measure in real time so that you have something to be able to optimize and say, hey, this is going better or this is going worse. Um, and then from there, what you're going to want to do again is really content is king, uh, focus on whatever that conversion environment is that you think is going to drive the behavior that is going to get someone to act and really get hyper focused on relevant content, good experiences, um, you know, optimizing for, uh, all of the core web vitals that have come out recently, uh, making sure that your social environment is responsive and using it as a place to build relationships but everything that you do from your content to your social to everything owned and earned should be pushing towards that conversion point eventually. And from there, you can start adding in little bits of paid, right? Just a little bit at a time as you expand to help drive that initial awareness, get that consideration and start getting people converting. So you kind of start from a thinking about it like filling up buckets from the bottom up. And as you fill up and tick off all the boxes, you start leveling up into the broader sphere. So in terms of mix, it's going to be very different depending on your client size and sophistication. Because if you're working with a, a business that has an existing presence that's very well optimized, you might then be focusing almost exclusively on paid media. Um, on the other hand, if you're just starting out, like go find a cheap CMS like uh, Squarespace or something else that makes it really easy for you to edit and experiment and optimize and really get comfortable with that and some basic analytics software to get started. Thanks, Brad. It seems like Christy and Brad all mentioned that first we need to find out the measurable KPI and the work around that. So I have a follow-up question on this. So from your research and experience, how do you find out what's working for the business in terms of the measurements? Let's start with Christy. Um, so th this is uh, sometimes daunting. I mean, um, if you're starting from maybe even nothing. Like I, I think kind of in my situation, I might've been starting from no tracking. We weren't sure really what was going on. We're not sure, you know, what our efforts are actually doing. Um, I think though, you know, um, if you're using certain tools, even if they're free or, or anything like that, like, Go you know, Google obviously has, has data that you can pull from. And, um, but, you know, for me at the end of the day, I bring my boss a report every quarter that, is showing the conversions and um, the business leads that came in the door from our efforts that I'm able to track. So, you, you know, even if it's starting with a, a spreadsheet and um, <laughs> just it, sometimes you just have to and just really trying to track back, you know, what keywords worked, what content um, was clicked on and um, and be able to, to, to see, you know, what did you invest in it versus um, what actually made money and you know who we ended up making a placement with because they found us initially online um i think um that's that's kind of the best way to see what's working and then make changes from there and find out where to pivot so so uh really to just answer i think it's just 
Um, if you're if you're just starting or if you're you're trying to find out where to start, I think it's to find out um, you know what what's actually what's the metric that's getting you to your goal of you know and like I said, a lot of times it's for for us at least it's clients um, through the door and um, what's the metric that's that's leading you there and um, track it like crazy as best as you can. <laughs> yeah, I agree. What's your opinion, Brad? Um, so this is not the sexiest topic in marketing, but uh, your taxonomy. Um, so what I mean by that is when you start getting into marketing, when you start getting into um, any field really, but particularly I find it problematic with marketing, making sure that your inputs are consistent, what you're naming your campaigns, what you're putting in your tracking URLs, how you're looking at things in your CRM, uh, how you're pulling all that together, all needs to line up. Otherwise, you don't have a cohesive story. Um, you're comparing apples to oranges and you don't necessarily have a way to, to look at that. So um, that doesn't need to be super complex if you're starting out. I, I am fortunate to have a team of data scientists and we have a whole you know numeric system that we use for key value pairings, but you can make it super simple. Have a, a Google sheet where you're managing all of your campaign names, all of your creative names. Uh, have metadata that you're capturing about the different variables uh, for those campaign setups or those creative uh, formats and templates. And then as you're looking at it, what you're going to want to start doing is validating how that uh, leading KPI predicted your lagging KPI. So if we are assuming that lead form conversions are leading to our, our sales, um, or our, I think it was hiring managers is what you said, right, Christy? So you would be able to look at that, um, you would do an export of the lagging indicator, and then you would do an export of what your leading indicators did and do a time series correlation to see how closely those actually predicted each other. Um, and that can all be done just in an Excel spreadsheet. There's basic formulas in there, um, quick plug for CSU for uh, having the, the Excel certification program. Uh, super must have for any marketing person. But with that, you can start looking at all the different KPIs, including the one that you assumed and seeing which one best describes and predicts the future uh, lagging indicator. And then you can optimize from there. Thank you. It seems like first uh, we need to figure out the consistent measurement. We can compare apples to oranges and then uh, we need a good tracking system to keep track to see what's actually working. Um, I also have another question. So how should companies that are different in size allocate the budget towards uh, different medias, for example, on the media, earned media and the paid medias? Um, because they would have a different size of the budget, of course. All right, uh, let's hear Chris's opinion. So I think um, I, I'm kind of the example of, of a smaller, small budget. Um, so, you know, first we just make sure that like the owned and earned media is, is running kind of like a well-oiled machine. Like that's, that's kind of the first thing that we are making sure is in top shape and, um, you know, because it's, it's what we have and we're, we're going to work with it in the best ways that we can. So, um, it's just necessary to make sure that your website is just up to date. It's informative. You have clear call to actions um, and then clear ways of people reaching out to you. So whether you're doing, you know, just emails, phone numbers, chat boxes, forms, um, you just really need to, to make it easy for people to reach out to you um, on those channels. And then um, I think I mentioned earlier, it's it's really important to just stay up to date on your social media, um, keep posting, keep staying relevant, um, and you will just want to show up on everyone's feeds and those are the basics that I think it's just, you just have to do that first before you think about paid media. Um, and then, you know, in our example, you know, we, we've kind of done the research, we've done a lot of trial and error and found that um, our paid resource has really been Google AdWords. And um, I just think with, on the paid side of things, you just need to go in as st strategically as possible um, and research and kind of know what you're getting into before you pay. And um, and then obviously I, it's it's always okay to make changes in the end if something doesn't really give you the ROI that you're looking for. Thanks, Christy. It seems like for the smaller businesses, they should prioritize on the earned 
and the own the social media media sorry uh, okay let's uh hear about a breath insight on this <clears throat> yeah um so it's actually the same i it, it in that you want to start from what you can own. Um, you, I oftentimes when I'm talking to clients, I'll tell them to think about their website as their salesperson that's pitching their product and think about their social media as their spokesperson slash uh, customer relationship, right? So that's really um, where you need to spend the most time because if you think about any experience you've ever had with a company, if you had a negative experience with a salesperson, if you had a negative experience with their customer service, you're out, right? Um, so all the paid media in the world isn't going to fix that. So make sure that you have those pieces really nailed down. And then when it comes to media, again, as I said earlier, think about it like buckets that you're filling up from the bottom up. Um, there's only so many people for most products uh, that are in the market at any given time. A lot of times we talk about it like the thin market concept, right? So if you're really hyper-focused, uh, if you got $100,000 to spend and you're um, starting with, you know, very low funnel exact match searches on a, on a search engine, you might not be able to spend $100,000 on that. So it's always thinking about, you know, where's my next best dollar spent starting from that bottom? What's my my closest, tightest target that's the closest to the point of sale that I don't want to lose to a competitor? And then how do I broaden on up? Because at some point, then there's not even enough people that are just coming in to support your growth. And then you have to think about demand generation. How do I build preference? How do I get in front of people who look like my best audience, et cetera? Um, so yeah, bottom up is the way to go for sure. And that's going to go, you know, double for small businesses, but it's the same for everybody across the board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brad. So next, let's see Ashley's example. So uh, I believe this will help our audience understand. So uh, we talked so much about how we should do it. Uh, those are very theoretical. Uh, Ashley will give us a very concrete example on what it means. Thanks, Sabrina. I'll have Heather pull up the slides. Um, so as, as Sabrina mentioned, I thought it would be helpful for me to answer these three questions with an active example. As I go through it, I'll kind of talk a little bit to the three questions that Sabrina walked the rest of the group through and answer those so we can dive right in. Um, so as I mentioned opening in terms of how we think about digital marketing strategy or marketing strategy in general, number one thing we have to align on is who is our consumer and what is our objective? What are we trying to achieve? So I talked to this, but just on a page, quick reminder for Philadelphia, it's all about driving purchase to preference. So lower funnel is the focus with our millennial consumer who we, we de-average and call the experience seeker by showcasing our point of difference, which is all about the immersive experience our product gives consumers. Go to the next slide. Now that we understand this, let's go to execution and implementation. We talk a lot at Kraft Heinz about the kind of the trifecta of three things coming together to drive relevance with the consumer when it comes to consumer facing communications. In this case, digital marketing we're talking about. And so how do you kind of bring context, consumer and culture together so that we understand and can reach our, our target consumer in a, in a right way that's relevant and drives talkability. And the next slide. So what do I mean by context? Next slide. In the for Philadelphia, what, I, what I'm walking you through, I should have caveated and opened, this is our holiday campaign that's currently live now in the market. So the holidays for cream cheese are huge. We call it our Super Bowl. Um, and the reason why is because we sell over 36 million pounds of cream cheese in our brick format. Just to contextualize, that is the equivalent of 8,000 holiday gift bearing Amazon vans. That's how much product goes out the door, October, November, and December on my business. So it's huge. That relate, well, how consumers use our product primarily in this window is through cheesecake. What does, what does uh, 36 million pounds of cream cheese look like? It's 46 million slices of cheesecake. And that's enough to feed the national audience of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. So again, huge scale in terms of context that we're talking about. Our growth opportunity is if we can increase cheesecake usage by just one point, that's a $60 million opportunity for us. So just contextualizing that, it's huge. If I can get one more person to make a cheesecake, I get really strong ROI. So that's kind of the business context. Go to the next slide. 
Now we talk about consumer. So understanding the millennial experience seeker, if you want to hop to the next slide. Within the holiday occasion, what's going on? So I talked earlier about this consumer is all about loving to cook, but they actually don't make cheesecake. Only one in three of our consumers make cheesecake. So during the holiday occasion of where my product is the most prominent in terms of sales out the door, my target consumer is not engaged with my brand, which is like a huge disconnect for us. So the challenge we're giving ourselves is in order to drive preference for Philadelphia, our job to be done, we need to figure out how to get them to make a cheesecake during the holiday window. You go to the next slide. What's going on? Like, what's the tension? Like, why aren't they making cheesecakes? And it's really because they find this younger consumer finds cheesecakes really boring. Um, there's, you know, very basic recipes, not a lot of inspiration online. And so that's kind of the core tension that we're facing in order to engage with this consumer. The next slide. So what we have to make sure we're doing is we understand our, their behaviors. So as I mentioned, they see cheesecake as something that's really boring. But when you look at the other perceptions tied to um, other baked goods they're making, there's a lot of excitement that this consumer has in this whole cupcake macaroon um, area. So like, how do you bring that kind of excitement around those baked goods to the cheesecake occasion? Go to the next slide. So we understand where we wanna focus. We understand the tension in this situation of cheesecake. And now we need to figure out, okay, how do we actually talk to them to change this behavior? So we have to understand their media behavior and consumption habits. We need to make sure the content we create to convince them to change their mindset to make a cheesecake is authentic. And we need to make sure that we're using influencers because they are influenced by a, a, a certain network, has enough amplification to speak to them and kind of align with their values to help them again think Think about cheesecake the same way they do about macaroons, for example. Next slide. All right, third of pillar of the trifecta is all about culture. So go to the next slide. So when we say culture, it's like what's happening in the world in this space of relevant holiday timeframe and baked goods. Hopefully most of you on the call watch Netflix and you've heard about everything is cake, both the initial inception of the meme that started in 2020 all the way to the show that's extremely popular and the trend that continues to happen in culture. This is what's happening with our consumer. They're actively engaged in this conversation. They, they watch the show and they understand the behavior of what the show is doing, which is basically driving over the top associations with is this cake or not in the context of, of, of physical goods. So what do we do with all this? You can go to the next slide. We bring this all together, all these three things together to get to our big creative idea. So if you can go to the next slide which we call cheesecake is everything. Our goal with this campaign is to inspire people to bake their own cheesecake creations by tapping into the culturally relevant is it cake trend, showing them endless possibilities for cheesecake being craveable and interesting. We're here with friends gathered near, but make no mistake for everything is Philadelphia cheesecake. It's cheesecake. That brand new cat. The drink in your hand. Even the piano plan. So this gifting season, let's all sing. Cheesecake is everything. Make your own. How do you play on this cultural trend in a relevant way with our millennial experience seeker um, through using our product as hero? So we want to promote this idea of like anything can be cheesecake and enable that with consumers as we communicate go buy your, your bricks of cream cheese. So in terms of media, how do we get to kind of the overall mix? As I mentioned in the consumer section of the presentation, it was really about understanding where they are media-wise. So you're seeing digital and non-digital media platforms here based on their overall media profile that we build. So the biggest thing to think about in terms of going back to the question on like how you think about the split of owned what we call owned, native, and earned. Um, owned being, I define as kind of your really efficient uh, volume drivers that give you really high ROI. So things like OLA and print have really high returns for my business. We wanna make sure that majority of our spend around 80% is typically the ratio we use are put behind these proven tactics. Then we think about native. So native, we define as high impact impressions, deeper engagement. We use these more for like using influencers, for example, we spend about 20% there. 
And then from the earned side, that's all about, you know, earned media PR. And we spend about 10% there. So we always use typically on a larger brand with, with more money, 80-20-10 rule. My advice to small businesses or smaller budgets is start on the proven side. Max out to Brad, Brad's earlier point on high efficiency driving tactics that are going to give you a really strong return on investment before you even start to have a conversation on these fun, what I call fun spaces of like native and earned. Uh, so we can go to the next page. Uh, for the sake of time, we can keep moving. This is some of our influencer content. Again, uh, send this out as a follow-up, but uh, part of our native spend on that 20% I just mentioned, we are hiring influencers across various spaces that are relevant to the trend, both on the kind of culinary side, all the way to um, those that, you know, consumers can identify, our consumer can identify with in terms of uh, an everyday usage or, or baker. And then last slide, I believe. And those are some of our digital assets that we're using in terms of the proven side. So what we're putting a lot of our 80% of our budget behind that really help us drive that return on investment. And then KPIs. So Brad mentioned earlier that you have leading and lagging KPIs. So overall, given our focus on our job data is preference, which is loyalty, our lagging indicator post campaign is all about share of requirements, which is overall at the end of the day, loyalty. Am I moving the needle on driving loyalty for my brand? But in real time for the campaign, we're measuring across two fronts. On the earned media side, so where our PR goes, or, or how consumers are talking about us outside of digital, we do it through number of impressions, quality features, and sentiment. And then on the social digital side, we talk about brand mentions and overall sentiment. And that kind of gets us an overall kind of brand relevance score. We track these real time and we have KPIs tied to each of them that ladder up to our overall annual KPIs for the brand across both quality media or media impressions, as well as um, overall positive to neutral brand relevance. I believe that is the end of, yep, yeah, let's end the deck. All right, thank you so much, Ashley. This is really a great example with many, many concretes in there. Uh, we actually received a lot of uh, great questions from our Q&A, and, &A, and uh, uh, I would like you guys to help them um, understand their questions. Uh, I will uh, just uh, read through the uh, Q&As. I think uh, uh, in the order of uh, we received, let me see. Uh, I think for the first question is for Christy. Uh, Joseph says, it sounds like most of your marketing is geared towards the people you sell. Do you market to the companies you sell to, or how do the two marketing campaigns differ? So, so, so basically for, for our firm, it's, it's just the messaging is, um, very different. Um, you know, candidates, it's more of, you know, a new career, a new job. It's more of, um, kind of vetting out the basically them as candidates but we post jobs we post out um, career tips interview tips um, because obviously that's part of our services is we help candidates through the whole process but our clients are um, who pay us they're the hiring managers and um, so our, our marketing towards them is obviously you know to help them find top talent so so really it's just a matter of messaging um, and our website is, is definitely split kind of into two sections with um, for clients and for candidates. And um, basically our email marketing, anything like that is is very tailored towards, um, they're, they're very different um, from a, a job seeker versus somebody who's looking to hire, so. All right, thank you. Um, the next question I think is for everyone. Um, Previous to the digital age, how did companies accomplish marketing goals you are discussing? Yeah, um, so a lot of times you would have like direct response uh, TV or radio ads where you'd hear the phone number 90 times over and over and over again. Um, and, uh, you know, catchy jingles to, to get that to stick in your head. Um, yeah, so it was a lot of that type of stuff. Then it was a lot of um, looking at the leading indicators there would be like uh, in television or in radio, they talk about TRPs or GRPs, 
uh, which are just target rating points, gross rating points, uh, which speaks to how many people you're getting in front of, how much weight you have in market. And then they look at um, previous to campaign, current to campaign and post campaign logs to see how the uh, the sales correlated with that. So very imprecise. I think there was a, a famous quote. I can't remember who it's from and I'm going to butcher it, but it was from back in the day where it was, uh, I know 50% of my marketing is working. I just don't know which 50%. Um, yeah, that was that was the state of things prior to digital. And honestly, as much as digital gives us, I would venture to say if people were being humble, a lot of them would say we haven't gotten that much better, even though we have more data. A lot of times, if you don't use it well, it's paralysis by analysis. So, gotcha. Um, okay, I'll go with the next question. Uh, since we have many questions here, uh, I try to get through them as many as possible. Uh, there is an interesting trend lately in the digital space that um, paints companies almost as virtual entities or personalities. In social media spaces, there is a unique interaction beyond your typical advertising or marketing. Some examples, Wendy's on Twitter roasting people, company interns making fake jokes or drama on TikTok to gain views. Can you discuss some tips on how you professionally enter into this space or how you might engage as an entity rather than a traditional company? Yeah, I can take that one. So we look at social media uh, two different ways. One is kind of going back to my proven or own content, which is like having social media ads that kind of help keep you know, a constant hum that allow, that allow us to drive broad reminders on Philadelphia. But specifically on the Wendy's example and in Philadelphia specifically, it's like what we call that is always on engagement. So like what's our always on engagement strategy with consumers? To me, it comes down to my two big questions I just or I, I talked about earlier, right? Who is your consumer? How do they operate in social? And then what do you how do you marry that with your what you're trying to do on the brand? So on Philadelphia for social, we know, as I mentioned earlier, our consumer is very interactive and social, meaning they if we you know try and banter with them like Wendy's does. We know that they're going to banter back with us. I've been on brands before, like our, my Heinz ketchup brand, where that social that consumer is actually very passive and social. They're open, they're watching, they're on Instagram, they're on it every day, several times a day, but they're not interacting. So as we think about Wendy's or another brand, it really comes down to clearly understanding how your consumer operates in the social space and what they will and will not engage in. Because then you can figure out how active you need to be in real-time engagement, as I call it, versus maybe no, my more core owned proven metrics are gonna work harder for me in terms of return on investment. Um, so that's kind of the balance you have to figure out on like, is the juice worth the squeeze to be a Wendy's based on your consumer behavior? Um, yes or no. And if the answer is yes, then you need to get into the nuts and bolts of like, okay, how do you marry relevant content and trend and culture, kind of my three trifecta with how you wanna land your brand point of difference or goals? Thank you. Um, there are two questions for Ashley's, <laughs> the following two. Okay, first one is, do you market um, Do you market to end users or customers who have customers? And uh, how do the two campaigns differ? Yeah, I always like to talk about consumer strategy and customer strategy. Consumer strategy being what we're talking about now, that I walked an example through customer strategy being like how I partner with effectively with like a Walmart or an Amazon. So both are equally important to driving to my business objective and both have slightly different nuances in terms of what I have to do on the customer marketing side. So I need to understand their objectives, right? What is a what is Walmart trying to achieve, especially during the holiday season with my cheesecake is everything campaign? And how do I adapt and marry my objective with them appropriately? At the end of the day, what we want to make sure we have is a consistent brand world and message, no matter what medium we're on, whether it's a customer platform or a consumer facing platform we own, but we do make slight nuances based on the retailer and their focus. So a great example is at Walmart, we have a specific, you know, campaign for the holiday, all about cheesecake, meaning my consumer facing national campaigns all about this trend of is it cheesecake. Where on Walmart, I have harder hitting assets on this is how you make a regular cheesecake because their consumer going to the store isn't necessarily watching the is it cake, you know, trend. So same message of I want you to make a cheesecake and be engaged in this occasion, but who I'm talking to will vary based on the retailer's kind of platform and consumer audience. 
versus what I do on a national scale, but still related. Thank you. And the next question, um, how are you getting to the insights you are presenting surrounding who buys cream cheese? When they buy it, why they buy it, etc. Have you experimented with things like incrementality in your media buys, or do you rely more on traditional analytics techniques to drive this info? Uh, there's a few questions in there, so I'll try and answer a couple of them. Um, so we have a, a, a robust set of data tools. We are a large company. We do have access to a lot of resources. So I'll answer this question one two ways. One is like, we tap into a lot of databases that our, our agencies proprietarily own as it relates to pulling down media and sensitive profiles, but non-company like non -company speak, like at the end of the day, I'm on TikTok every day, Googling my brand, right? That's my own insights that I'm following. And we have activated on things like that. So while we do have really fancy tools and like I have this great persona that has all these attributes and everything, I'm actually, I actually find more value in just getting on my own social channels myself and looking to see how my brand's interacting with, reading my reviews on websites from a customer perspective. So data collection can come from anywhere, both free and also paying a lot of money to an agency partner. But I find a lot of value in on, on just doing it myself and digging into the conversations happening in real time on social. Um, in terms of incrementality, I think it goes back to like my 80-20-10 rule. So like 80%, I need to make sure my media is working hard for me to drive a return or else I, or else like I then struggle to justify how, why I'm using media in the first place. Right. So 80% is kind of sacred. There are standard metrics that we track there. Brad alluded to some of them in terms of what that looks like for ROI and R uh, and ROAS. Um, the, the 20 and 10. So the 20 of the native, that's where we get interesting test and learn incremental opportunities that are in the form of partnerships uh, online and out of home. And how we measure incrementality there is honestly at a custom program basis. So a great example is Philadelphia participated in the Pitch, Pitchfork Music Festival this year with a brand experience that had an online element. To measure that's a little difficult, right? Like how do you understand a return there? So we had to put really strong KPIs in place around brand relevance, talkability, am I driving conversation that we would argue maybe doesn't necessarily tie directly to sales at this point, but it is helping us drive this overall relevance devotion piece that still helps us kind of support our bottom line focus of pref our bottom funnel focus of preference. Not sure that answers the question, but hopefully it gives a little bit more context. All right, thank you. Um, next question is for everyone. Would you say companies are spending more of their advertising dollars in the digital marketing arena or are they still spending most of their dollars on traditional advertising vehicles? I, I think there's been uh, some some tracking and some studies recently that kind of definitively answered that they are spending more on digital at this point. We hit the breaking point, I think, in 2020 specifically. Um, so that's, I mean, just across the board, uh, I believe that that is the number. I don't know if it's fallen back down to pre-COVID levels or not, um, but I know that that was the case at that point in time. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Next question is for Ashley. Is being a legacy brand stand in the way of engaging the millennial audience? I don't think so. I think it's a great challenge. I think the great thing about Philadelphia is that it has so much love, like, and it's in it's been around for over 150 years, um, and yet it's still highly relevant. I mean, our, my business is growing exponentially. The biggest thing, the biggest difference though with the younger consumer is they're aware of my brand. They are, they have a, an emotional connection to me, but they actually require more work for me to convince them that I'm worth the money, especially as private label brands or store brands, as, as you might also hear them, continue to improve their quality. How do I think about and convincing younger consumer that Philadelphia is worth paying more for? They already see the value in it, but they want to see more how you translate that to actual product usage. So uh, relevance is there. To me, the difference is how do I make sure they're driving preference for my brand um, and getting actual, you know, them to actually pick up the product and buy it is the challenge, less so than like relevance of my brand to a younger consumer. All right. Thank you. Um, 
Sorry, I think I, I may have uh, accidentally screwed Mitch over a little bit. Um, I answered a question saying we might be able to come back to it, and it was from further up the feed, um, which he hasn't gotten a chance to get in. All right. Um, I will read the questions, and then, Brad, you can answer that uh, so that, that all, all of our audience know. You mentioned the measurements a few times and the importance of a healthy analytics driving optimization. You also mentioned the importance of taxonomy adherence. I know there is a huge struggle in Google Sheets with campaign naming, placement naming, tracking code validations, et cetera. How do you ensure adherence so that metadata is effectively passed between teams and doesn't require ton of Q&A and ETL at VMLYR. We find that Excel or Google Sheets allow for lots of a human error downloading, formula breaks, et cetera. Yeah, um, so uh, that is a very, I, I'm, I'm glad that question was asked. That is a very real problem. Um, it's a problem that our company often is, is hired to solve. Um, so we use a tool in our, in our systems without trying to give away all the secret sauce. Um, but it's a, a third party tool. It's called smart sheets. Uh, if you're familiar with it, uh, which allows you to do a lot in terms of, uh, developing pretty robust controls for, uh, the menu selections, including multi-selects formulas that can merge uh, and concatenate without this character limits that you would have um, within a uh, an Excel spreadsheet. We also, though, do have a pretty robust ETL uh, solution. Uh, so we switched over from abbreviation-based taxonomy, where everything is sort of a hard-coded one-for-one value that goes into your uh, naming convention to a key value pairing. And we're pulling everything back out from all of our systems into an Amazon data warehouse um, where we're then using our, our smart sheets as the Rosetta Stone that, that parses all that information and, and reassociates the metadata. So it, it is not an easy solution by any stretch, but if you're just uh, a starting out company, um, you know, Google Sheets are a good place to start as long as you know to watch out for some of the, the things that can break UTM codes. Um, and then uh, if you are a little bit larger company or if you're running into these, I would recommend even without all the ETL and stuff, we've had a lot of success running uh, clients through that um, smart sheets process. And again, the way that we do it is that we actually build the naming convention into our creative traffic workflow. Um, so that we have our, our uh, media buyers, our account teams, our project managers, our creative teams, um, all and our digital activation teams all within the same platform. And we use status updates to pass it back and forth and append information in a way that we can control the views and make sure that people aren't accidentally editing things from other folks. Um, so yeah, if you if you have the resources and ETL system with data warehousing where you're using key value pairs so that if something breaks, you can just go back in and change the metadata without having to change the the um, the actual code is uh, the preferable. Accepting that, I would recommend Smart Sheets. And if you're just starting it out and don't need a paid solution, I'd still recommend Google Sheets. All right, thank you. Uh, due to the time limit, uh, we have a, a few questions remained and answered. Uh, for example, one of the audience wants to know some suggestions for financial advisors. I believe Brad left you an email address. You can contact him. And I'm. I'm sure Brad is very happy to provide you some resources. Um, I'm sorry that it seems like we couldn't go through all the questions today, um, but we do have some go-to resources for every one of you um, that uh, we can share with you. Um, we we have, um, uh, Heather, can, can you pull up that slide? Yeah, we have some like go-to resources if we want to implement digital marketing and to know how to actually do it. Uh, this is some uh, like first step so you can go with. Um, okay. <clears throat> and uh, um, 
we I believe we have a really really great discussion today, and uh, thank you so much, Brad, Christy, and Ashley, for all of your insights and uh, being with us today. And also, thank you so much to our audience. You asked the excellent questions. We do have another cornerstone speaker series coming up Thursday, January. 26 on the topic of economic outlook for 2023 the labor market the discussion will be led by dr bill costias from our economics department so we hope that you can join us for that webinar as well thank you again and uh, have a great day we have a really really great section today thank you Thank you.